Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming today to our session. I guess thank you for coming to reInvent. I know it's been a trek for most of the people to come here, but I hope you found it useful and exciting to hear about the new things that we announced, and you can think through the art of the possible and how you can use all this to help build new solutions and solve problems for you and for your customers. My name is George Ramos. I am the Principal Customer Solutions Manager for Vodafone in AWS, and I am joined today by Mark Fabres from um, Accenture Supply Intelligence, and Carl Woodrow, who is leading the big data and analytics technology for Vodafone UK. Just to bring a little bit of context of what we're going to talk about today, I'll start with the journey of Vodafone. <clears throat> they were formed 1984 in Newbury, West Berkshire, started as Rackal Communications, 1985. They placed the first phone call, and since then it was onwards and upwards growing to become the global telecommun telecommunications provider we know today, through acquisitions, through organic growth, through a lot of innovations, a lot of the things that we take for granted today came out of Vodafone's R&D. And then to bring this with AWS, when we, as a team, were formed to help Vodafone be successful in the transition to cloud in late 2015, early 2016, actually Vodafone UK was already using AWS. But they were using AWS more in a shadow IT fashion. So people that needed to do things quickly, they've got a project, for example, and they need another test environment or another dev environment, they couldn't wait the six to 12 weeks for the normal procurement life cycle for infrastructure. So they would use AWS and they'll get things done, they get things done quickly. But with this comes the risk of shadow IT. These people were in silos, not communicating best practice, not necessarily adhering to the policies of the organization. A lot of this changed on one Thursday afternoon in February 2017, when we as a team were coming out of a meeting and were approached by the UK CIO's office. And they wanted us to help them with a burning problem. The burning problem was that they needed to migrate a critical customer-facing application out of their current call provider and onto AWS. It was onto AWS because it needed to be done in seven days. So again, the procurement lifecycle doesn't work. And of course, we love that challenge. And the next day, we got on the ground, we created the plan, we ordered the Snowball, which itself was a new technology back then, to go and get the data out of the call provider. By Monday, we had people landing in and start designing, start implementing. On Tuesday, we have the data loaded. Wednesday, we were doing UAT. Thursday, we were ready for the cutover. And that in, its, in itself is a great success. But also, it was the eureka moment for people to get what AWS can do. It allowed people to come out of the shadows and actually approach us to do things properly because they could see the problems they could solve with AWS. And it gave us the mandate to actually do things properly to come out of the shadows. And doing things properly meant to create the operation model for Vodafone UK to be able to deploy workloads to cloud. We ran an enterprise acceleration program which helped build that um, operating model. We've trained a lot of people, um, and I'm talking about deep dives here, using our service teams to come and talk to Vodafone on how to use the tools we have got. We helped Vodafone create the reference architectures for platform services and infrastructure services, but also for security and that they really did a step change in how Vodafone UK matured into the cloud because people didn't have to ask the same questions anymore. They didn't have to ask permission for the same thing. If they adhere to the reference architectures, half of the problem, half of the build, half of the design was done. And at the end of the day, Vodafone had a cloud factor that would take requirements and demand from one side and create designs for applications that were scalable, that were well architected, well operated, secure. And that allowed us then for AWS to become the new normal. So uh, launching now a new application onto AWS 
is normal. There is no extra hoops to jump through. And because of that, we have got a lot of workloads already running. That's a small subset of the applications we're running for in, in Vodafone UK. We're going to talk about customer care in detail in a, in a few seconds. Digital front ends and their microservices that support them, including some of the middleware, is on AWS and is moving. Some network analytics workloads um, uh, starting to, uh, to appear on AWS and we, we, we're running them. Communications offering, super exciting. You can place a call using Alexa today using your Vodafone UK number. So you don't have to take out your mobile phone. You can be hands-free around your house roaming and being on, on the phone. And all these things, all this experience that uh, the maturity, the experience Vodafone UK started accumulating meant that uh, from the shadow IT days where EC2 was the predominant usage of the AWS services, that 95 plus percent of EC2 usage became just a small part. It's at the moment and the 50 percent of EC2 usage. It doesn't mean Vodafone UK in absolute numbers is doing less on EC2, they're doing lots more, but the ratio of EC2 compared to the rest of the services is getting smaller and smaller. And that in itself is a sign of maturity because Vodafone UK is using the right tools to solve the right problems. No point in patching an operating system or upgrading a database. It adds nothing to your customers. If anything, actually, it's a detriment because you might have to have some downtime. Bringing this all now to what we are to talk about today, Vodafone UK business <clears throat> had this dreamland that they want to change the way they care for their customers. So they wanted to move away from the old world where in a typical world, this is my customer care, what will they, where does the customer fit into this? To this is my customer and that's a problem they've got. How does my customer care can solve their problem effectively and efficiently? In order to do that, in order to create this excellent the customer experience, they needed to understand their customers, the attributes of each customer. But also in more detail, they needed to understand in a granular detail the information about the customer that helps them understand the problem they have got. So this is George, he's a customer, that's the, these are his attributes, so the, the contract he's got, what he's doing, but also the history. He tried to do this, he tried to do that, and that's why he's calling us today. And also, by doing this and you understand the customers, you can put them through the right channels, which of course in itself, you know, customer care in many, in many cases is a cost center, right? By doing the right channels, by self-service, for example, you drive down the cost of customer care, but also why not flip it around altogether and use customer care as a revenue generator to actually, since I understand my customer, I understand what is useful, I understand the partners of George, I can proactively approach George at the right time with the right offering to ensure that he stays with Vodafone. At the same time, the technology organization needed to build a platform that supports this transformation. And the uh, on-premise platform, Hadoop based on on-premise platform, wasn't allowing this to happen. It wasn't able to scale to run the amount of models that Vodafone UK wanted to run. It couldn't scale for the amount of data they wanted to use for these operations. It wasn't able to scale for the amount of people that needed to go and experiment on the platform in order to run their models. So we're going to spend the next 45, 50 minutes or so with the two journeys. How Vodafone UK technology transformed and how it enabled Vodafone business to transform. And with this, I'll pass you on to Carl. Thank you, George. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time today talking around how we went approaching and building the analytics platform to give us the underpinnings to support that business dreamland that George was just talking about and to try and address some of those uh, technology constraints and concerns that we had with the environment that we had before. So how many of us are already in AWS today? Is a, a, most of you already using AWS? Who's considering Amazon at the moment or hasn't moved to the cloud yet? Not many. Anyway, so I'll talk through, for me, what the sort of value is within the cloud and what it meant for the big data and the analytics team as well. As George pointed out, I think there's a host of sort of classic infrastructure, compute, storage, database within Vodafone that are utilizing uh, AWS. Um, but from an analytics point of view and really sort of starting to build a data lake and sort of cement 
some end analytics as a core feature across the business. It was, it was something that we sort of needed to look at the value of the cloud and, and to adopt. Um, so for me, it's sort of three key factors. It's the agility, the flexibility, and scalability um, of the various cloud providers that exist today. And as we start walking around the sort of little side points there, we look at the service offerings and the variety that the cloud offers us. When you're looking at an on-premise infrastructure and you pick a sort of Hadoop-based infrastructure or a platform, you're kind of limiting yourself to the choices that you make and you're limiting yourself to one tool for, for the jobs that you're trying to achieve. Whereas in the cloud, you've got that sort of breadth of offerings that we've seen at AWS in the conference this week that really allows us to pick the right tool for the right job. Um, velocity, it's reducing time to market. Um, so we think around, George mentioned, the scalability challenges. You think around trying to deliver capacity for an on-premises cluster. You need to predict that capacity. Then you need to go through your supply chain to order your servers. You then need to get them delivered. They arrive at the data center. You need to get them provisioned into the rack. And then finally, you need to get the software provisioned and installed as well. So that's, that's a long time. Whereas in the cloud, obviously, with the sort of infrastructure as code tooling that we have in automation, it's very quick to bring, bring products or bring services um, to our consumers internally. Um, also looking at the sort of value and reducing costs and the volume as well. So key to us was how we approach the cloud from a serverless point of view. So we're not running our infrastructure 24-7. We're not overcapacitizing our on-premises solutions. Um, we want to really look at how we reduce the costs as we're working in the cloud. Um, and then scaling as well, that again comes back to the physical infrastructure. You can't just scale up and then scale back physical infrastructure. You have to pay for your maximum workload, whereas the cloud really allows us to move forward and it, um, sort of scope up capacity when we need it and then bring that back down afterwards. Um, and then it supports change in requirements as well. The agility of the cloud is really there to, to, to sort of help you. Like I said, there's no one size fits all. You can pick the right tool for the right job and you're not locked into those three-year sort of license agreements um, and stuck with the tool that you chose maybe two or three years ago, you can quickly change and iterate. So what's the value of building with AWS? So we've decided on the cloud. So what is it that gets us um, into AWS? Well, we talked about the variety of choice. Um, and from an analytics point of view, there's SageMaker, and you've probably all heard around the massive sort of double down on machine learning this week. Um, there's EMR, and there's various tools to support our data pipelines, like Glue, like Data Pipeline, um, EMR, Lambda as well, that really sort of move us forward. And then from a velocity point of view, it's working with our partners, such as Professional Services and Accenture, to really help us pick up and move quickly and deliver this into production and into the hands of our internal customers to use very quickly. And we'll cover that in a minute. Okay, so looking at reducing costs, we talked around the capabilities of the serverless technologies. So focusing on technologies like Glue, like Lambda, and where we're having to use things like EC2 instances or things like EMR clusters, really treating them as ephemeral objects and sort of approaching them with a serverless, uh, a serverless sort of um, approach. And then volume, I think, I mean, George mentioned the sort of amount of services that we use as a company. But we're by no means the biggest customer by a long way that is in, is in um, AWS. You think around the Netflixes, the Ubers, those sorts of companies. AWS has proven at a massive scale. And the cool thing as well is obviously low cost petabyte storage and the ability to tear that down when we don't need it. No longer having to provision the disks for the capacity we need. And we can then just push off our storage once it's been consumed um, to low cost storage. And then underpinning that all, is the knowledge in the community. So I think if you look at the conference today, what I've been, or this week, what I've been surprised about is it's not a sales pitch. It's, it's customers like Vodafone, um, like the various other people that you see in the booths that are talking to you about their experience in the cloud. So it's, it's how they've solved problems, how they've used the Amazon services to deliver a unique solution. And that really goes across the board as you look out into sort of the meetups, the startup groups, and that sort of thing. There's a great community that underpins AWS as a platform. Okay, 
so now we get to build in the platform uh, and what we want to achieve. So if we go back to the keynotes on Tuesday from Andy Jassy, he talked around being successful in the cloud. AWS have noticed there's kind of four traits that you see within the customers that are really successful. The first one was senior management buy-in, and the second one was aggressive timelines, not just dipping your toe in the water to be able to sort of see what's around, what services are available. So we have a look up on the screen. So the head of big data at the time in Vodafone UK gave us a challenge that in three months, I want an end-to-end -end production use case running in a secure, scalable AWS analytics platform. That's going from nothing, no, no sort of, no experience of AWS in the big data team to being able to ingest data, process data, build, train, run a model, and then output that back into the campaign system and, and communicate back out to our customers. So that, that was our goal and our objectives that he set us. So I'm just gonna look now at how we approach that across the three months. Yes, there's four on there. I kind of take away that there was the Christmas holiday, holidays in between as we rolled in and completed in the second week of January. The third point from Andy Jassy's uh, keynote the other day was around training. So my second day at Vodafone was spent at the London AWS offices in immersion training, learning about EMR, learning about Athena, learning about Glue, supported by George and the team to be able to sort of bring up the skills within the team, within the data scientists, so that we could have that velocity as we move forward. Okay, so what did we do in October? So before we could even bring one sort of file worth of customer data to the cloud, we obviously need a secure infrastructure. We need security and privacy sign off as well. So that was sort of the first sort of two sprints worth of effort was to get a design and an infrastructure in place that security and privacy were happy with. Um, and it's very much using the sort of classic, classic AWS services like CloudTrail, CloudWatch, KMS, IAM, all integrated to the Veritas um, Security Operations Center to give us like day one proactive monitoring of the data that moves to the account. Um, and obviously we need data to flow into our environment as well. And, and at that, that point in time, there was no AWS transfer for SFTP. So Vodafone were running their own SFTP servers, which was connected to, to our uh, data center in Dublin um, via Direct Connect and would give us that path to get our data into AWS. So now we've got the capabilities to bring data in, we need to be able to process the data and start making it available for the data scientists and teams like Mark so that are gonna build the sort of the actual business cases and the value on top of the actual raw data. So we went all in AWS services, um, all of the developer tool set as well. Um, that was just again from a velocity point of view so that we didn't have trouble with uh, network firewall change requests and things like that. But the services there are highly capable. So this, the sort of flow that we have up on the screen here was our very first CI-CD pipeline. So that's continuous integration and continuous delivery. So this is how the data engineers would go about releasing a glue job into production. So they create a feature branch, they push it into code commit. We then use code pipeline to pick up that commit create our infrastructure through cloud formation. So in this case, it's a glue job. So it's, it's not really infrastructure at this time. It's kind of just a definition um, and an S3 bucket with our test data. We then use code build to initiate and run the unit tests and then to initiate glue to run our integration tests so that we can apply all our quality checks, all our data validations before we release to production. And at the end of that, we obviously tear down using cloud formation again. So at this point, we've now got the capabilities to build a data pipeline for, um, for the data that's coming in. So as we move to December, we're now approaching the sort of end of our three months, um, and we really need to start making that data available for the data scientists. So when the developer or the data engineer is ready to commit to production for their glue job, basically it goes through that same pipeline. This time there'll be a pull request um, and then once that's reviewed and proved and merged, that will kick off the same pipeline that we saw on the previous screen. And then obviously at the end of that, rather than tearing down the infrastructure, of course it tears down the test infrastructure, but it will then go on to redeploy the glue jobs or update the existing glue jobs that sit in production. And with the serverless approach as well, we used the Lambda capabilities to orchestrate the data flow. So as data came in, we would process it on the hour 
Um, and then, so that's using CloudWatch schedules, and then using events through S3 as the files were completed from Glue and the jobs were finished, we would then archive the raw data um, into the archive bucket and transition it to Glacier. So we've now hit December, we've got data coming in, we've got data being processed. Now we really need to give the data scientists the capability to train and run their models. So as we just sort of fell over into January, there'd been, there'd been um, sort of proof of concept in and uh, prototyping with SageMaker during December as the data was being made available. And then what we did was kind of using the similar principles that we had previously um, from a data engineering perspective, created a pipeline for a releasing of the models. So again, using code commit, code pipeline, code build. This time though, wrapping that output up into a container and publishing it in ECR, which would then be scheduled again through Lambda. And as that kicks off, it would use Fargate um, as a task-based container to be able to then initiate the prediction and the training using the SageMaker APIs. And then of course, delivering out the output back into S3, which we then take into our, into our campaign system, ready to publish and communicate the outbound messages to the customers. So that was our very first journey from an analytics point of view in the cloud with AWS within the space of 12 weeks. So as we move forward, um, as that was successful and we'd hit our target, the next challenge from um, Head of Big Data was I want all the existing models to be migrated into the cloud data analytics platform by the end of September. Well, that doesn't sound so aggressive now. There's about 20 models, and we're talking around sort of six months or so to be able to achieve that. Um, but I mentioned that the sort of flexibility and the agility in the cloud and, and the ability to handle changing requirements. Now our data scientists weren't saying, no, we really want to continue using SageMaker. They said, you know what, EMR is a great tool set as well. Can we use that? And can we use the Spark machine learning libraries within that? So not only did we have a SageMaker pipeline, we now had to go and invest in building a machine learning pipeline that would be supported um, using EMR as well. Um, so how did we go about that? Well, this is where we, we worked with AWS professional services. So I talked about the fact that Vodafone had a lot of capabilities around computes um, and, and classic infrastructure, but we kind of struggled a little bit on getting forward and, and really accelerating with the analytics and, and the machine learning pipelines. So working with professional services, they had access to those required skill sets. So we had a, a working together with them in a conjoined scrum team. You had a big data architect and three DevOps engineers from professional services, but we also supplemented that team with a data scientist and a data engineer from Vodafone UK to ensure that we had success. We didn't just hand them the document and say, here's our requirements, please deliver it in 12 weeks time. We incremented over that um, using Scrum um, and working very closely with them. And I think, I don't know if anyone's worked with professional services or understand how AWS and Amazon go about delivering products to people, um, but they start with a working backwards principle, which is you come up with the headline of the feature or the product that you want to release, you create a press release behind that, um, you also have a fax, so sort of questions and answers behind it as well, which really sets out what it is that you want to deliver in that period, and it keeps you honest as you start sort of moving through the process of delivering, that you can go back to it and see what it is you want to deliver. So our, our sort of top level headline was Vodafone UK launches a cloud-based, an AWS cloud-based analytics platform. And beneath that in the press release, we had all the various bits and pieces that we were going to achieve from the machine learning pipeline, um, from the way that the data scientists would be able to pick up the analytics and use services like Athena as well um, to work on top of that. So again, just looking at the sort of infrastructure that we put in place to be able to support this. And the first couple of things that we asked for them to help us with um, was a couple of sort of technical debt items um, and a pain point that we, we sort of hung over from that first 12 weeks. So I talked around the fact that we used um, a sort of homegrown SFTP service that was just running off of EC2 because there was no transfer for SFTP at that time. Well, we were getting corruption occasionally in files as it would land in S3. There was like no end-to-end -end validation that we could use very easily without doing a lot of engineering work to, to, to sort of build the MD5 hashes and sort of make, make our own validation pipeline. Well, you know what? Transfer for SFTP does 
all of that for you. And it was a very easy choice to make because all we had to do was then switch out our endpoint and point it to the new one in the cloud um, in AWS once we wanted to make that transfer. And it's great because it's all integrated with KMS as well, so you get all the security and encryption in place um, without having to lift a finger particularly. The other aspect from a sort of technical debt point of view was a frustration part for the data engineers. And this shows how quickly um, we can work with people like professional services to turn, turn around a problem, because we did this in one sprint. So the orchestration, when a data engineer wanted to release a new glue job, they had to change a configuration JSON file, but that was sat coupled with the code, which is a pretty bad practice, um, to be honest. Um, so what we really wanted to do was decouple the code and the configuration. So, like I said, within one sprint, we'd broken the configuration out into its own code commit repos repository, and then the commit events were caught by, um, by CloudWatch um, events. We would then use a Lambda to publish that configuration direct to Dynamo. So therefore, as a data engineer, all I need to do now is commit my JSON to a repository, and then it's automatically published and available in, um, in our orchestration pipeline. So that was just a couple of pain points we had. Now getting really to the crux of what we wanted to achieve, um, which is building the analytics platform um, and trying to support EMR from, uh, to, for our data scientists. So we sat down. We had a great room in the AWS offices, a massive whiteboard where we really talked around what the process was for releasing a model. How did the data scientists work? Not looking at the technology, first of all, but what it is that they, how they worked through and how they delivered their model. Um, and there was some, uh, there was a pretty sort of a, a, a desire for the data scientists to use Apache Airflow. They had been playing with it locally um, on their laptops. They liked the sort of DAG architecture. Um, and they, they really wanted to go with Airflow from an orchestration point of view for their models. But as we kind of take a step back and kind of think around the principles and the operations that we wanted to achieve, we wanted to use a serverless approach. We wanted to consume the managed services that are available to us so that we don't have the operability headaches, so that we don't have to monitor EC2 instances or containers, um, and that we can just use the serverless technologies, which is why we ended up choosing on step functions. Um, so at the time, it was, had a, had a uh, first-class integration with SageMaker, but it didn't support EMR at that time. So we did a lot of custom work to be able to support EMR. Grateful to say that this week, I've found out and it's been announced that it now supports EMR natively, so we can rework our code, and, and it was the right choice um, for us to make at the time. So the way that the data scientists work now then is they have a repository that they commit their model to, that then, again, we capture that commit event. We schedule, or through that commit event, a Lambda triggers, publishes the artifacts into S3, and triggers the state machine um, to, to kick off the orchestration of the model. So as we move into June, um, so we're now heading into the sort of last of the six sprints that we had with professional services. And the, the sprint goal for um, that final sprint was to deliver the pipelines into production and have the model running day one, um, first hour. So the last little aspect of that is obviously where we wanted to be able to schedule our models. Um, so again, we have a separate code commit repository which has in it your JSON configuration. And, and what's great about the solution that we put together with professional services is it's really, really flexible. As a data scientist or a data engineer, I point at um, some configuration and say, this is the configuration of my EMR cluster. This is the instance types I want. This is how I want it to scale, um, whether I want to use spot, spot, spot instances or run on demand. Um, and then also how I want the model to behave within that. Do I want to train every time? Do I want to predict um, once a month, once every other month, every day? It, it's really flexible to support that completely. And in fact, it was so flexible and so powerful that even before the end of Sprint 6, we had other data engineers and other data scientists already starting to work on data products, um, on data on models, and data ingest through this pipeline as well, because it really is that, that flexible. So it's become more than just our machine learning pipeline at the moment. It's now a sort of fully-fledged pipeline that we can flex to anything that we want. 
And we did, uh, on that last day of Sprint 6, we sat in the Ab Amazon offices, um, deployed, and had the first model run in within under an hour um, on, the, on the platform, which was fantastic. So now, just going back and looking at the success, so we talked around the business dreamland, and we talked around the technology challenges, and how the system was to underpin those two things to allow uh, people like Mark and team to sort of build on top of that. So from a velocity point of view, we've reduced access to our data by 90% in time. So previously, data scientists were scratching around in the data warehouse, um, trying to find their data, having to extract it, perhaps bringing it to their laptops and that sort of thing. So they can now do that in less than uh, a, a fraction of the time they used to. And we, once that data is available with the pipeline, we're delivering models within one sprint, whereas before, it would take three to four sprints. From a variety perspective, we've now got more relevant data in the last six months in the platform than we ever had in the previous two years on the on-premises solution. Um, we've got over 50 data sources, and I think the key there is, and it kind of links back to the velocity, how quickly we can bring data in, how quickly we can release jobs to process and curate that data and make it available in the data lake. Um, so we've got over 20 models scheduled now, and, and that's just models. We also have about five data products um, and have had over 1,000 successful executions of that pipeline since it launched. We've got over 12 months, um, some instances 24 months of historical data in the data lake versus the two to three months of sort of sample data that the data scientists were previously using. So as we start to think around intelligent care and understanding our customers, we've got now a much deeper, we've got a much broader set of data sources and a much deeper history as well to really understand their journeys with us. And then finally, looking at the value. So we've reduced the cost by around 70% by moving off premises and into the cloud. Um, and we've also been able to deliver feature service upgrades, sort of feature upgrades to the customers. So as Amazon or AWS releases new versions of EMR, it takes us less than a day to be able to offer that out to the data scientists. So if a new Spark version is released and made available, that took a year previously on premises. We're now doing it next day. Um, so I think very successful move to the, to the cloud from the analytics platform point of view. I'm now going to hand over to Mark, who's going to talk around how they've made use of the platform to deliver the intelligent care piece. Thank you very much. Um, so we've now we've got a platform, we've got loads of data, we've got this brilliant analytics capability. What the hell are we going to do with it? How do we actually add value to the business? So I'm going to talk a little bit around the intelligent care program that we've been running with Vodafone. But before I do that, I just wanted to give a, a bit of background from a business side as to why this has been so important. Um, Vodafone, pretty much like any telco or, to be honest, anyone that has a customer service function, um, have got a legacy issue, which is that customers have been trained over many, many years that if you want a question answered, if you want to talk to us, pick up the phone. Picking up the phone is the best way for you to communicate with us and get your questions answered. And that's a problem for Vodafone for two reasons. One is that it costs a lot of money. So picking up the phone is by far the most expensive channel to be able to communicate with us. But secondly, and as important, is that customer expectations have changed. So customers are way more engaged in digital channels now than they were previously. They have an expectation that they should be able to self-serve. They should be able to find the information that they need um, and deal with that question themselves. So there's this mismatch now where they've been trained over time and they don't necessarily know that these digital capabilities exist. So the challenge for us when it comes to intelligent care is how do we bridge that gap? Um, so how do we take them from a world which is a traditional view of care which is you pick up the phone, you ask your question, you have an interaction, and hopefully that works, to a world where every interaction is personalized. So it's something which is specific to you, our understanding of you as a customer, and we serve you at that point in time with the particular question that we have. So that's been our goal from Intelligent Care, is to, to build personalization, to build intelligence into every single interaction that a customer has with Vodafone. So where did we start with the platform? 
Number one was we spoke about uh, the number of data sources that we have. So 50 plus data sources now landed onto the platform. But what do we do with it? Um, and there were two critical data assets that we created right up front as part of the project. Um, the first is the customer analytic record. It's essentially getting everything, every attribute that we know about that customer into one place. So I know everything about you. I know your preferred channels. I know what you like to talk to us about. Uh, I know how much you spent on your bill last month all of the itemized items that sit, where, sit there, the orders that you've placed. Um, I know when you pay your bill, how much you like to pay your bill, um, everything about you we have in that one location. And that sits at the heart of everything that we then do. The second element is the journey analytic record. And this is where we start to try and do something slightly different with the data. So a different lens on how you like to communicate with, with Vodafone. Um, and this actually also sits at the heart of how customer service is managed as well. So traditionally, contact centers manage based on interactions. So you call up, and that's one interaction. Um, and we measure that with a set of KPIs that are likely to be things like average handling time, so how long was the call? Um, it will be first time resolution, so did you call back about something similar within a fixed time period? And then what was your customer satisfaction for that one interaction? But what that lacks is one really important element, which is context. And that's the context of what sits around that. So have you just placed an order? And when was that order? Have you been online immediately before you've then picked up the phone? Have you actually called us five times in the last couple of days, then actually you're getting more and more frustrated that your question's not getting answered? All of those things become really important in terms of how I then deal with you as a customer when you're calling up. The journey view allows us, from a data-driven perspective, to create that lens on the customer and the journey that they been on. Because from a customer's side, if you think about it, when you're talking to your telco provider or whoever else, you're not going to think about the world in terms of, I'm calling up just about my billing question today. My billing question naturally then goes into maybe a problem that I've had with my device, or maybe it goes from billing into, oh, turns out I'm eligible for an upgrade. So you can't manage it based on these individual intents and these individual interactions. We have to look a bit broader. And the AWS environment and the journey analytic record gives us the frame for that. So what that does is it gives us that single view of the customer, and it gives us the data foundations that we then want to build on to actually drive intelligent care as a program overall. So how do we actually do that, and what do we deliver to the customer using that, that data that sits behind it? Um, and what we have is two different routes that we try and change the experience for the customer. Um, the first one that I'm going to talk through is what we call uh, reactive intelligent IVR. So this is someone has picked up the phone and they have already chosen that they want to talk to us. Um, so key thing here is I want two bits of information, really. I want to know who you are, and I want to know why you're wanting to contact me. So we have a digital voice element that sits at the top of the IVR. Um, that goes through an intent classification process. So I have your phone number because you're calling in, so I know who you are. And you're also told me, and I've classified why you're actually contacting. And this is where the machine learning models that sit behind this start to get involved in terms of what do I do with you next. Um, so that information gets passed on to the AWS platform. And what gets passed back is a recommendation of what to do with you now. So taking that journey view, taking the context, of everything that's happened around you, where's the best place for me to send you? And that might be that I just send you straight through to talk to an agent. So if you're that person that's been on the phone five times in the last 48 hours, trying to steer you to a digital platform when I know you've been online and you've tried to self-serve and you've not been successful, that's going to be a horrible experience and it's not the right thing for me to do. But if I'm someone that has been digitally engaged, don't contact very often, but maybe just need some help to understand that there's a capability that exists there, maybe I can send you to the app and send you to the right page, the right information for the thing you've told me you're contacting about. Or potentially, uh, from a digital maturity perspective, the right place is web chat. So web chat is still human assisted. I'm still talking to a person. So there's a gradual kind of process that we can go through based on that individual customer, how they've engaged with us in the past, what they want to talk to us about this time, and we find the right place to steer someone. So what happens in practice, so I'm on the phone, 
that message comes back through to say, I want to steer this customer through to web chat. And there's a voice message that plays. And that'll be something along the lines of, did you know it's much quicker to do this through web chat? We've just sent you an SMS message which, with a link. We've got an agent ready to talk to you now. So an SMS message lands as the person's on the phone. They can go and click onto the link in the SMS, connects them straight through to an agent, passes the intent across as well. So we know what you've told us you're talking about. That means the agent on web chat also knows what you're, you're contacting us about. And there's this seamless process. And ultimately, what we want is that person to hang up the phone, not talk to us on voice, and start to engage in digital. Exactly the same for the other channels that you can see here as well. The big advantage of this is, one, it helps provide a much better experience for the customer because they can self-serve, they can self-select to go into that channel. And it also starts to change behavior. And what we've seen is using this personalized approach, you can move people up that digital maturity scale. So it might start with someone going to web chat. But if they have a good web chat experience, they won't pick up the phone next time. They'll go back to web chat. And actually, the next jump from web chat is maybe I want to engage with the bot. So uh, Vodafone have Toby, their, their bot. So the natural next step is, OK, I can automate that. And then we go on that process and we move through. And when I talk about the results in a second, you, you'll get an understanding of how that's starting to shape up. The second element that we look at is what we call proactive care. Um, and this is more complex analytically, much more targeted in terms of what we're doing. And the major difference here is that if we think about reactive, I have those two really important bits of information up front. I know who you are and I know why you're contacting. And alongside that, you've already picked up the phone, so I know you want to talk to me about something. With proactive, we need to try and fill those gaps. And we do that with three analytical models that we've created. Um, the first is a more traditional call propensity model. So uh, we predict that you're going to call within the next 24 hours. But that, that's not enough for me to then go and target you with a proactive message. The next element is then to predict why you're going to be contacting us. And this comes back to the jar and all of the data that we hold about you. So for instance, if we've just seen that you've been to Las Vegas because you've been to AWS conference and you've made a bunch of international calls and your bill's much higher than normal. Um, that linked with the fact that I'm predicting that you're going to call, I can start to infer what you're likely to contact us about. Then the last element, um, which also from a uh, painful experience as well with this, is uh, an uplift model. And the uplift model is there to essentially predict how will you respond to a proactive message. Because the, the biggest risk with this from a proactive side is that I wake you up. And the last thing I want to do is to actually prompt a contact when one wasn't going to happen previously. So we use those three things together to start to target, first of all, which customers I want to contact and what information I want to send them. So the, the difference here between the two is that my success measures are slightly different. For reactive, it's about getting you into a digital channel. With proactive, it's actually much more around contact elimination. So what I want to be doing is giving you the information that you need up front. So you actually don't need to click through and talk to us. So I tell you about the roaming tariffs and the fact that your bill is slightly higher than normal, and these are the reasons why. You can still talk to us, but hopefully that's just reassurance enough that you don't then need to come back and speak to us. But ultimately, with all of this, it's about driving better customer experience, greater self-service, digital adoption, and the, the ultimate of that is then to remove calls from the contact center. So to talk about results, so what have we actually seen coming out from this? Oh, let me go back. Um, there we go. So we've seen some really impressive results so far. And I'll kind of split the two numbers on the right uh, down individually on purpose here. And that's because we took a two-step process to launching Reactive. Um, and the first was to look at that purely from an experience perspective. So we launched uh, deflection within the IVR, but it was one size fits all. So you as a customer for a particular intent, you would get the same experience no matter who you were. But that on its own saw significant benefits. So a 15% deflection uplift that came as a result of just uh, deploying the experience change. The bit that really uh, made things fly was then adding the model on top of that. So at the point that I'm really personalizing, so I'm picking the right channel for you at the right time, suddenly 15% goes to 40%. And that becomes the, the game changer in terms of the experience for the customer, but also the benefits to Vodafone from a cost saving side as well. Um, and, and this is, I think, a good point to talk about kind of the critical success factors that, that we
we've seen through this process as well. Um, and for me, it's, it's three really important things. Um, one is clearly the analytics. So we can see the importance of personalization, the importance of understanding my customer, and as a result, using that to serve them. The second piece that has to sit alongside that is the experience design piece. Having the best data scientists, the best analytical models will not be enough to give me the kind of values that we're talking about. That has to sit alongside best-in-class experience design. And I have to have those two things together. We can see with the 15%, experience gets me part of the way there, but it has to be that experience linked with the analytics if I'm really going to drive the maximum benefits that I want to. All of that also then links into ultimately customer satisfaction. Um, and what we want to see is an uplift in satisfaction across the customer base uh, linked into those cost savings as well. So that gives us a bit of a view of reactive. Then from a proactive side, we've also seen some really great results. Um, so we've seen around 16% um, deflection. We have focused typically on um, the payment area, so the biggest intent driver in Vodafone and for most telcos um, is around billing queries. So if we can proactively contact people, whether that's around first bills and bill shock, if it's unexpected usage charges, if it's remi reminders around when people need to be making payments, um, they're really critical elements um, and that we're wanting to, to, to uplift the experience on. Um, but rather than necessarily the cost savings here, the bit that I've found most interesting is the customer satisfaction element of this. Um, so what we've seen from the feedback coming back through the CSAT scores is that this is a differentiating experience for the customer. And when you sit this alongside the reactive element, you start to drive a bit of a shift in terms of how the customer engages with you. And what this leaves is a, a kind of warm feeling for the customer. Vodafone understand me they care about me, they're wanting to communicate proactively and make sure that I'm, I'm okay. And they give me that option to go and talk to them as well. So when you link that kind of proactive element with a really personalized experience in terms of where to send me in the right way to try and serve me, those two things start to really complement each other together. So this is the, the journey that we've been on, the results that we've had so far. Um, but this is really only the start. Um, so if we think about uh, kind of where we can go with this, you've got a platform which is incredibly powerful in terms of the analytics capability that exists. What we've deployed so far has been very focused on the voice channel. So the natural extension here and the big vision from a Vodafone side is that we want to be personalizing every interaction across every single channel. And I want to have a completely consistent experience between those channels channels as well. So it should be the same intelligence, it should be the same personalization, whether I'm picking up the phone, if I'm on the app, if I'm in Toby from a bot side, or if I'm online. And I want every one of those experiences to be matched to you as an individual, to that journey that you're on with Vodafone and where you're going. Beyond that, it's then around how do we apply that to other parts of the business? So how do we take that same approach and apply it to sales or upgrades or internal management of processes? Uh, and there's that structure that sits around it. So to come back to kind of some of those critical success elements, what one that I, I kind of missed off there was around um, value realization. Um, and this is something that has kind of underpinned everything that we've done on the project. So every investment of time, every investment of money, I have to have sight of the value that that's going to give me. So which use case do I go after? It can't be something that's based on the business's intuition and what the call center manager thinks are the main reasons that people are contacting. It has to be something where I can point to the data that says I have a million calls that come in um, and th this is the, the, the potential value that's going to come from those. Um, it has to be something where I can go and test that approach, see it in real time and start to improve. So we've got an operating model and a structure now, which means that I can test and learn across everything. So we're constantly changing what we've deployed so far. Um, we're constantly looking for improvements that can be there. And that's a fundamentally different way of going about dealing with customer service within Vodafone. Um, and that's been a massively important thing from a cultural perspective. It's not something that you just go and deploy and you, you leave it because it's performing really well. It's something that's a constant cycle that we go through. So that's everything that we wanted to cover from today in terms of the journey that we've been on so far. We're going to move into QA in a second. Um, but one thing just to mention is that the three of us will be in the telco lounge, which is down there and around the corner um, straight after this session. So if there's any questions that you have kind of after the QA, Q and a or you want to talk to one of us one on one, then we'll be around. Um, but I think we've got just around 10 minutes for a QA now. So if anyone's got any questions, then now's the time to ask. I'll be coming around with a microphone. If you could please ask your question in the microphone, I will come to you. Uh, 
um, that all looks actually very interesting. Is this going for Vodafone Group as well, or is it going to be only for Vodafone UK? Just for Vodafone UK at the moment. So there's no plan to preach it to the uh, other kind of uh, Vodafone? There are discussions there in terms of how it can be reused, or at least the same principles, um, but at the moment it's just, just from the UK side. Okay. Don't be shy. Nobody else? <laughs> One more. <clears throat> Do you use uh, the other services like Transcribe, Comprehend, uh, TextTrack, and all that? So, yeah, we've used, um, well, we've proof of concept around uh, Transcribe. Um, so we've taken the call center, um, we've taken the voice calls and actually pushed them to text. Um, and we've done a lot of topic modeling around that as well, as, as Mark was sort of saying around trying to understand the intent of the person calling um, as they speak in and talk to the IVR and they give their intent. That's not always what they necessarily want to talk about. Um, so with the, one of the data scientists has actually been doing a lot of work around topic modeling based on, um, based on the conversions. Um, we, we did use Transcribe for a part of that, but we also have another internal service that we use as well. And it's, it's something that it's, it's a really good point in terms of what someone tells you at the front of the IVR and what they actually talk about are generally slightly two different things. Um, so what we try and do is to use that intent in terms of what someone tells us, but actually look at the outcome of the call. Um, so if you can see that someone's made a payment or if you can see that an order's been placed or a complaint's been raised or an issue's been identified, we can track what's actually going back into the CRM systems, match that against what someone tells us at the start. And if there's a, dif a difference between the two, we can help try and understand why that might have happened. Language. It's just English at yeah, the moment. Yeah, predominantly English, yeah. Uh, my question is two polls. Uh, first one is, did you use AWS Connect, which is the one that was launched for like uh, uh, connecting for the contact uh, for, for, for customers? The second question is, the applicability of your machine learning models for other cultures in other countries as well? I know that you use it for the UK. You know, how easy would it be porting it to like other countries, uh, you know, maybe in Asia or other locations as well? I think in terms of the, the second question, um, I think they'd definitely be applicable elsewhere. I think you'll always get differences from a cultural perspective and also between industries, um, but the, the fundamentals of it, I think, are going to be very similar and looking at past behavior to help predict and understand how you can steer someone in the future. I think they're, they're going to be very similar. And sorry, what was the, the first question? AWS Connect, did you use it? We, we haven't done, um, but it is a, a very interesting proposition. Mm. So can we, go, can we go back a little bit to uh, when a customer calls the IVR yep. and then you can decide on the right channel for yep. them. So how does that work? Like I'm a customer, I call into the IVR and then you realize that actually my request would be better treated through chat or through text. Yep. Like do you just tell me, hey, just go online and start a chat session? Like, how is the experience there? And okay. How do you see the reaction from the yes. about it? So what, what happens is we, we play you a voice message, which would be, we, we think you'd be better off going down a different route. Then an SMS message arrives in your inbox on your phone, and that will always have a, a link within it. So if it's web chat, it'll be a link that will open up a web chat window. If it's the app, it'll take you through to the app or the right page from the digital side as well. So it's content specific in terms of link to the intent that you've told us that you're contacting about, and then automatically steers you through and then essentially you, you hang up the phone at that point so you, you drop the call you go into the SMS and then you engage that side as well and what we're constantly measuring is any callbacks that come from that so there are some people that may click on the link not want to go down that road so they pick up the phone again and um, so we're constantly looking at that and how we can try and make improvements and there's a lot from an experience perspective that you can do there um, really simple things at times in terms of how many times do you play the message what kind of gap do you have so when we first deployed we found that we weren't giving in someone enough time um, to actually be able to go and check the message and click and we'd end up connecting them with an agent too soon so then they've kind of gone back on the phone they've got an agent already there so you're not going to then go through to the digital route that we want to try and take you through can I ask you a follow-up question? Yeah, of course. Uh, so how many customers make it through the alternative channel? 
So um, typically what we've got at the moment, sorry, just, so deflection numbers or who actually engage into the, the channel. So we've got around 40% of customers will drop off the call and then engage. So about 60% end up still talking to an agent. Oh, so they can choose still to stay yep. talk to the Asian, so it's not... Like yeah, so the, this, okay. there's no hard deflection is the way that I describe it. So if you stick around on the phone, um, we'll just go and connect you through to an agent. So it's, it's your choice. Um, we're not switching that capability off. Um, it's saying that we think this could be quicker and easier for you to do through a different route, and if you want to go and adopt that, great. If not, then stick around, and we'll connect you through to an agent. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I saw that you know, many of your, or your metrics that you're using to evaluate success are, you know, deflections and CSAT. Yep. Uh, I would imagine that, you know, retention numbers of your subscribers is, like, keenly important, especially in, in the care space. Um, and CSAT is usually not a good predictor of retention. Um, how are you measuring that and using that to evaluate success? Yeah, so there's some tracking that's in place around a whole bunch of different metrics. Um, obviously, it's slightly more difficult in terms of retention, in terms of the time that that takes. Um, but what we try and do is to match up that transactional MPS score in terms of the, the individual transaction. We then look at MPS overall, and then we track that against retention as well. Um, so far, all of those are looking very positive in terms of the experience that we give people. No impact on retention, or if anything, a positive impact on retention, as well as that cost saving in terms of the actual service time as well. Got one just behind you. Oh. I'm curious how you handle customers who just say operator up front. And you know, historically, at least in my vertical, recovery behavior hasn't been successful. So I'm just curious what you've learned. So um, with those customers, we played around with a few things, actually. Um, what we found is that deflection numbers for those people are slightly lower. So we still play a deflection message. Obviously, the thing that we don't have at that point is um, what they're actually contacting about, because they're just asking to speak to someone. Um, so typically, we would steer them into web chat as a go and talk to a person route. Um, but a lot of people are still taking that up. Um, so it's a more difficult group to go after, um, and it, it's that they're a group that are slightly more wedded to voice, and we don't want to force them to go down a different channel. It's just giving them the option if they want to. So it's a slightly more generic message that would be played, um, and for those that do adopt, we see fairly good um, adoption in the future as well, um, but we're not forcing someone kind of out of, of the voice channel if they don't want to go. Could you explain a bit more about the proactive campaigns? Uh, how does that work every day? Yeah. Uh, so it depends on the campaign. Uh, so for anything that's billing related, um, a lot of the time it's around when the bill lands. Uh, so you'll see a big spike at the point that a bill lands in, in your inbox. And there's uh, usually about two days afterwards as well. Um, so what we're looking to do is to match that usually one day before the bill arrives. So you're trying to pull forward um, so before the bill has landed and before that contact comes in. Um, so what we normally do is it's SMS-based. Um, so it would be uh, an SMS that would get sent out. There's actually a model that sits in there as well to look at, and it's a, a model that had previously existed around the best time of day to contact someone in terms of the response time that you're going to get. So it's more of a marketing-based model that still helps us in terms of the comms there. Um, but it's around an event. Uh, in uh, the billing case, it's the bill. If it was roaming, it might be that there's been a spike in terms of the roaming uh, charge. Uh, but there's a prompt that will always drive that and will look to be pulling that before the customer is, is actually going to pick up the phone. Well, we've got time for one more, if there is one more. If not, then please remember to give us your feedback. Is there a one, one more? Sorry. One more. One more. Hi, uh, I was wondering if the upfront cost of developing all this has uh, already been offset by the savings that you've seen, or if that will happen in the future, or if the goal was simply for uh, uh, customer satisfaction. So y yes, it has is the kind of short answer. Um, it's, it's one where I guess the, the origin of this, interestingly, was it was driven from a customer care perspective. 
um, and then the platform has been created as something which can then get used by other areas of the business. So it's an interesting dynamic in terms of there had to be that business imperative to drive something to change, um, which but the, the platform has been built in a way that's usable by anyone within the organisation. But yes, the, we're talking multi-million pounds worth of savings that have been achieved so far. So um, just coming back to some of the numbers, it's around 1.2 million calls that have been removed, which is it's the equivalent of about one month's worth of calls coming into Vodafone at that point. Um, so it's a significant drop um, and also a massive shift in terms of um, the channels that customers are actually contacting Vodafone on now as well. So for the first time, I think this month, um, web chat and Toby is a bigger contact channel than voice. Um, so in terms of actually moving customers away from picking up the phone into other routes, the, the numbers don't lie in terms of that actually happening. So yeah, the, there's, there's a significant business case there and now there's a lot of other opportunities elsewhere within the organization as well. And it's also the technology business case also stacks up. I think, Carl, you mentioned yeah, a few so, of them. Yeah, so the technology was 70% saving on the versus the on-premises versus the cloud platform as well. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're out of time. We are. If you can, please provide feedback about the session so we know what we can do better next time. Thank you for your time. Travel safely back home. <laughs>